Hi, my name is Mike Waldridge, uh, and welcome back to AI UK. We're almost at the end, but no, we're not quite there yet, so please hang in with us. Uh, we've got one final session for you through the looking glass. And in this final session, we've invited some big thinkers to come and think off piste, off the rails, left field, out of the box, to come up with some really creative ideas about what the future might look like. And we've got a very special presence to share this session. Uh, so I'm delighted to be able to welcome Ken Kukier. Uh, Ken is a New York Times bestselling author on technology and business. He's a journalist at The Economist and he hosts its weekly tech podcast and he's a regular keynote speaker. He's also an associate, uh, associate fellow at Oxford Said Business School and he's also a great presence on Twitter. So if you're interested in technology and business, I urge you do follow him on Twitter. It's extremely entertaining. So without further ado, Ken, over to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That is so generous an introduction and of course, my tweets are only beloved because I retweet Michael. So there's sort of this amite there. So if you follow Michael, you can also follow me and you'll see Michael rehashed through the lens of uh, how I highlight and, and vaunt his incredible ideas. And I have to say, speaking of incredible ideas, the past two days have been absolutely remarkable in terms of people coming together, thinking about artificial intelligence in the here and now, uh, the great benefits and the great uh, successes we've had in recent years, some of the path-breaking research in the lab bench right now and also being deployed, and the future agenda going forward for the world as well as in particular for Britain. And I think it's been really an extraordinary event and a great opportunity to think about the here and now of AI and what it will mean for the future. But of course, this session is not about sort of the lab bench and the here and now of AI and what it means for the future, we wanna cast our gaze much farther ahead and think about the future and the pros and cons of that future and, and where we're gonna be and how we can shape the future because of course we're not passive objects headed into the future, we're subjects who actually can mold the future according to our values, according to our ambitions, and according to the most nefarious basis nature that we have as well. So we've gotta be on guard at the same time as we can be very optimistic. And luckily, we have some extraordinary people to be a part of this conversation and to spur our thinking about what it will be like through the looking glass. And let me introduce them to you now. Dr. Kate Devlin is a senior lecturer in social and cultural artificial intelligence at King's College London. We have Tamandra Harkness, who's a broadcaster and also a book author on big data, which everyone should read. Does size matter? Of course it does, it's big data. We have uh, Professor John Crowcroft, a uh, researcher at large at the Alan Turing Institute, hometown advantage here in Oxford. And we have Gemma Milne, who is a technology and science writer and a researcher. Welcome. And of course, Ruby Wax, who's the chancellor of the University of Southampton and also an expert on mental health issues. So with this as a big, broad panoply of interesting people who have interesting things to say, let me crystallize the conversation by forcing you to answer a question in which you can only answer, to start us off, with one word, one word answer. And I'm gonna pick on who I want to go first and just go down the line. Today, we are in 2021. And if we cast our eye back 10 years ago, we had a financial crisis cast it even further back. It was 9-11. If we look forward 10 years, where will we be? We look forward 20 years, where will we be? Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Tamandra, you first. Uh, optimistic, but I uh, think- John. <laughs> You're on mute, John. Optimistic or pessimistic? Yes. Good answer. Gemma. Uh, neither. Ruby. Sort of. <laughs> Whatever's going. Whatever's going. This, this, this. Kate. Yes. What? Optimistic. Optimistic. <laughs> Optimistic. Optimistic. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. Nobody obeys rules anymore. Okay. <laughs> so that's okay. You you all fail. But that's all right, because right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go immediately to the attendees. And we're gonna ask the same question to all the people who are 
watching and participating because we're going to try to make it as participation friendly as possible, even though we're in this virtual setting. And I'm going to bring you in and out of the conversation as it goes on during this hour. So let's start right now. If you go into your Slido tab in the hop in browser, you'll see that there is a question that you're being prompted with. And that question is, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? And let's say somewhere between 10 and 20 years out. What are you? Are, do we favor, does the future favor the optimist or the pessimist? I'm now looking in the chat function to see <coughs> who is going to actually, um, who is part of the organizers to tell me what the answer is. Uh, and uh, I don't know it yet, but we'll get it. Um, John has, has messaged us to say that he thought it was a yes, no answer. And so John, before I tell the room what the room thinks, tell us, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Both. Both. This is useless. Okay, um, we're supposed to crystallize the debate. However, luckily, on a digital setting where you can't sort of flounder and live with ambiguity, we do have uh, an answer. And the optimists outnumber the pessimists uh, uh, three to one. It is basically 72% optimistic, 28% pessimistic. Uh, and that is uh, an, a, a very interesting finding, not totally unsurprising. I think people who are in AI would feel very optimistic by all of the um, re remarkable uh, successes that have happened recently and it sort of favors, engineering maybe favors the optimist. Um, but let me go turn to the panel and ask, um, for those people who are on the bench, why were you in the middle? Why did you feel like it wasn't right to choose one way or another? I think for me, it's because it, 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 it depends is obviously the worst answer to any question um, on the planet, but I think is probably the most true answer to most uh, difficult questions. Um, but I think it's because it really depends on what you're talking about. You know, is it like optimistic about whether or not AI research moves forward, then yeah, okay, maybe you could say optimistic. But if you talk about general state of politics, maybe you think it's different, depends on the country you're in, who you are, your background. So um, I think for me, I'm optimistic about some things and then a lot more pessimistic about others. Ruby, you said both. Well, no, you know, it depends how honest you want me to be. I mean, if it, if, if it makes my life longer and I look really good, but the rest of the world is an ashtray, am I happy or not happy? You know, it depends what hour you ask me. I hope everybody's happy and we're all, you know, whatever. But tell me what a, an optimistic view is. I don't know. It's all about me. So as long as I'm there to see it, I'm, I'm going with it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that that's a real fair answer. So before I, I don't want to dwell on this, but I want to come back to it. Let's start thinking about some of the technologies that we imagine the future will look like and start thinking about, well, when does the future happen? So in this, I think 20 years is an interesting time frame. Uh, the iPhone is about, is only a little bit over 10 years old. We sort of remember what it was like 10 years earlier, many of us, 10 years earlier still. Things haven't changed that much, but of course they've actually been completely revolutionized at the same time. So if we extrapolate and say the same thing is gonna happen, what should we expect? What do you expect life to be like in say 2040? Uh, Gemma, you're asking the first. The, I mean, you're asking the girl who wrote a book telling everyone not to talk about hype and then as now a researcher telling people to be responsible about talking about the future is literally what I do for a living. So I tend not to really try and cast my own visions of the future forward because I think <laughs> I think it's problematic. Um, but uh, what does 2040 look like? I mean... I, I, I hope, tell me, let me tell you, I'll tell you what I hope it thinks like, because I'm currently pregnant, right? So I'm going to have a, a kid in, in 2040. And um, that certainly changed my perspective about how I think about the future, so, shall we say. I hope that, uh, I don't know, they're coming out of education and feeling really positive about what their opportunities might be. I hope that we're not still having the same conversations about climate change over and over and over again in, what, 19 years time. Um, I don't know, I hope that they are able to have housing. I hope that they're able to travel in a sustainable way, you know, that I suppose that's kind of, it's, it's, it's sort of basic things, I suppose, that I'm hoping for um, in a lot of ways. And I hope for broader people to have that as well, not just us here in the UK. So to the people who are, uh, who are attending, who are, who are the, the, the attendees, um, tell us in the chat function what a baby toy, an AI-based baby toy will look like in 2040 so that we, so Gemma has an idea of what her 
son or daughter will be given to their child. Um, Kate, why don't well, we ho hopefully you? not when they're only 90 years old, and, you know. <laughs> hey, you don't have to work anymore. It's 2040. You know, everyone's rich. I mean, everyone's Bitcoin. Everyone's just like eating. It's like Wally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm optimistic. I'm not that optimistic. Um, <laughs> so I am optimistic, a self-described tech optimist, definitely. And I think that we we won't see a huge difference in, in terms of, you know, things are incremental. We're already so much AI already in use around us and that change will probably be quite gradual. What I do think we'll see in, in 20 years time is uh, lots of adverts on TV, if we still have those saying, have you been missold decisions by an algorithm? Maybe you can claim for your algorithmic bias and we'll have um, lots of uh, redress for some of the issues that are occurring right now. That would be nice. Okay, Tamandra. Well, I, I think the reason I was going to say, but uh, before you, you cut me off is that I think a lot of what will happen doesn't depend on the state of what AI can do, but on the whole the whole bigger context and not in the political context, but the kind of the context of us and what we want it to do. I think at the moment we we look to it to solve a lot of things that are not really tech problems that are yeah, at best political problems and sometimes even problems about us and how we find fulfillment in life. So the idea that people will be playing with AI toys in 20 years is, I think it's entirely plausible, but whether it's a good thing, I don't know. I'd, I'd quite like to see the AI doing the boring, repetitive, dirty work so that we can get on with the important interpersonal stuff. But I think that that's really, really dependent on us and the, and the choices we make and how, how, how brave we're prepared to be about how messy human beings are, which is what makes us brilliant, but also terrifying. Okay, so let's dwell on this a little bit and let's, 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 let me pose a question to you. Today, who makes decisions about what AI does? Is it the engineer or is it the public? Technical. Well, in a, <laughs> in a sense, it's the engineer, but the public lets it lets the engineer make those decisions i mean i, th I think it is reasonable when you say but you know we complain all the time about our privacy and our data being collected and and our choices being taken away and so on but but we still go on using this stuff and i think that's a very reasonable point because i, th I think it's less a case of engineers cooking up stuff and foisting it forcing us to use it it's much more a case of engineers cook up stuff and go hey this is cool this is interesting who'd buy this and then if it happens to meet some need that we have uh whether that's a practical and emotional need we tend to go for it i mean the positive example of that i think is text messaging and profoundly deaf people uh who picked up text messaging realized they could now interact with people all over the place on a completely normal level playing field they didn't have to do the terrible type talk thing where they used to have to type and then someone would literally ring you up and read out the message so suddenly text messaging completely levels the communications playing fields for profoundly deaf people um, and i'm sure whoever designed text messaging didn't plan it that way but you know here it is a wonderful thing and then there's also more negative things, I think, where we we look to technology to meet our needs in a in a much neater, more predictable way than people consistently refuse to do. Uh, but that's I think that's probably more Kate specialism, that that kind of area. Can I just come in a little bit on that? Who's making the, the choice thing? Because I think it's interesting to talk about the sort of difference between the engineer sort of coding the thing in and then the public in terms of their usage or buying. But I think that it's it's a it's a much bigger question than that. I mean what's funded is also about what how you know if something gets uh, gets funded then therefore you then hire the engineers to to build it and then it gets put into the world right and if you don't regulate a particular thing then there's a gap in the market or you know there's there's so many other people that come into play when it comes to making these decisions I mean Kate shouts out technocrats was the first sort of um answer to that question and I think when we have this discussion about whose choice it is I think we have to be a bit more realistic about, I don't want to say the hidden forces, but more what's going on in terms of the real sort of political economy behind um, all of this stuff. Sorry, John, you've had your hand up. I'll, I'll let you come in. <laughs> I was just um, going to agree with this. The techno, see, I'm not a, a pessimist or an optimist because the techno optimism is not a great plan um, unless you include how humans use things. And collectively, humans, the public, behave more stupidly than the most stupid member of the public. 
collectively. Collective intelligence is just not a thing. Um, and the best use of AI would be to figure out how to augment collective human intelligence so that we didn't make bad choices. There were great talks yesterday about uh, in the conference about uh, technical work on climate. There's been awesome work on uh, vaccines uh, where collective intelligence was thrown at a problem with lots of clever support from technology. But the combination was a really cool thing. The collaborations were better than the sum of the parts. Those are, those are just two examples, there are others. And if we could make that the common case, then we might get out of the things one will be pessimistic about. But if we don't, humans will make the wrong decisions. We will not avoid massive climate disasters and all kinds of other things, but it is feasible to do it. But it doesn't, if you just rely on humans, we just rely on technology, it ain't gonna happen. So the combination is really interesting. So why does the panel think that we're going to be relying on humans making decisions? I thought the whole point of AI is we're gonna be pulling human decision-making out of more and more aspects of reality of life in the same way that we've been pulling superstition, right, out of more and more aspects and folklore out of more and more aspects of our lives. What do you, you know, first of all, let's define, what are you talking about as reality? You know, I, it, it's wonderful that every, we have to do less and less, but it didn't give us any more spare time or enhance our lives. So yeah, we'll do it faster, sexier, you know, whatever, but will the human, whatever it is, you know, it's like asking, who, who dominates our lives? Does the press give us the garbage that we swallow or do we have a hunger for the garbage? Yeah, so it's it's a hard thing to untwist, but I think we better before we start saying the future's this, the future's that. We have to understand the human animal is greedy and the more you give us, the more we'll eat. And we'll get further and further away from that thing. Don't forget this conversation is about mental health. The reason we're so sick now is because our brains are scattered. We're, technolo we're technologically geniuses, but emotionally we're morons, you know, and we're trying, to, we're trying to reconcile that balance. So before we get into, is tech gonna save us? What do you call saving us? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah I mean, go have sex with a lobster, but you know, do I have a nice life? I don't know, what's the question? <laughs> and we made up all this internet stuff so that we could do all this communication. And we have this wonderful example from, you know, text messaging, you know, for, for, that was great. Uh, but, but the social media uh, drives the misinformation, disinformation, you know, conspiracy theory, in an, and, and that contributes to very bad mental health problems as well. In, you know, so. All this communication and we're hunkered in our corners sending out little tweets like a flare from the sinking Titanic. You know, none of this is feeding the food. You know, it all smells good, tastes good, yeah, it's fast food, but you know, what did we really want? Let's go back there. What, as humans, what, what's the thing that makes you want to think, yeah, I'm going to live for a long time and I have a good time. N nobody can define that anymore. But don't we need to go a little bit further than just asking like what it is we want or what who's making decisions because if you think about it in terms of like who's been making decisions for years that's caused a lot of harm to a lot of people and it's not been machines it's been humans it's been particular types of people that have been in particular types of power roles in society so if you ask what do we want and the people who have the loudest answers are the ones that have power then they're going to dictate what is there for everybody else so it's not just about kind of passing on you know the, the the ability i mean i agree i agree with what you're saying uh, ruby it is about asking those questions and being able um to to i don't know ask different kinds of questions but it's also about how do we change he how we hear the vo the answers from more people as opposed to only hearing the answers from certain kinds of people or filter through some kind of machine that has been built on god knows what data in the first place right you spoke on a thing saying there should be you know if, if there is going to be how will AI be able to help us psychologically? That's the most interesting. If it makes my voice lighter so I can hear what I really think, then I'll be able to deal with the whips and scorns of outrageous fortune. But if that noise gets louder, then I'm lost. So um, I, we can't even make decisions anymore because I don't know where I end and the machinery starts. And my whole fight through life is to say, I wanna use the machines. I don't wanna be used by them. So, you know, somebody's got to help us through the jungle before we have fun with this stuff. Otherwise, it's dangerous for our health. And the masses are idiots. They'll swallow anything you shove at them. <laughs> I, think, um, I think AI has to be legible 
not just explainable. And what I mean is it, 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 should, be, it should be a teaching function. So that when an AI makes a decision, it just doesn't say why and how, but it, you, the people witnessing it learn and then they acquire knowledge and skills to apply that. And eventually the AIs will go away because everyone on the planet will be good at making informed, emotionally fulfilling decisions. Uh, this is my view of where the technology should go. Uh, and then most AI would then revert to being tiny things that just uh, avoid your electric scooter going into the curb or wherever is necessary for, you know, um, uh, but but that's that's my view. You know, other people might disagree. Um, this, the, we have spoken so much in a panel about the future of AI and, and the future in general about the limitations, the cognitive limitations of the human mind and human group today. I'm trying to make sense of what that means. And I'm trying to figure out if there's any deeper you know, revelation by that. Well, I think but the thing, this is one of the things that shapes the kind of AI we get is it's, it's one of those things that we look at ourselves and the way we feel about what we are lacking or what we're not good at then shapes what we hope AI will do. I mean, you know, as well as what we're actually trying to make it do. So it's like the idea of the singularity, the idea that you get a, an AI that is smarter than any human and will outstrip us and therefore will become the, the dominance, if you like, the dominant sentient form. I, I think that very clearly reflects whatever it is the person coming up with the vision thinks about humans. Either if you think humans are awful and, and stupid and self-destructive, then you go, oh, well, we, you know, we'll make an AI and then it will destroy us because it will see that we're awful and stupid and self-destructive. Uh, or if you, if you think that we are you know, we just we lack the big picture and we, we're not smart enough and that's that's the problem then you imagine something that's incredibly smart and benign and will administer anything for us in this kind of godlike way it's like we've we've made ourselves a god-shaped hole and then we, we imagine ai filling that hole um but i think that's i mean in a sense i think the interesting thing about that is what it reveals about how we see ourselves but i don't think it's necessarily a very fruitful way to design AI, but I think we should be looking at, well, what, what, what is it that AI is good at that we're not good at? And AI is yeah. good at handling an awful lot of information all at once and finding patterns and, and that kind of processing thing. But it's, it's not good at context. It's not good at intuition. It's not good at all the, I mean, all the political things that Gemma was just talking about, how, you know, who's in charge, who has the power, who gets to make the decisions all of that political stuff would be completely baffling to an AI because an AI doesn't have self-interest. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not aware of its own mortality. It's not aware of its own place in society because it doesn't have a place in society. And that's, that's what we need humans to be doing. And if we can get the AI to deal with the stuff that we're not good at because we lose interest with repetitive tasks or we miss details because you know, we, we evolved to look for the, the exceptional tiger on the horizon and not to count blades of grass, but AI is really good at counting blades of grass. So I, I think we need to slightly flip it around and go, well, look, th there are just certain human things that even if we're not that good at them, even if we find them difficult, they're just essentially human tasks because they're about what it is to be human and human society I, and then there's I other can't. tasks that that machines are good at and let's get the machines to do those and free us well, up to, to deal with the mess we haven't been able to do that yet you know everybody said now you have spare time nobody knows it's like saying here's some spare oxygen what what, what is spare time because other human needs like i need to be loved and i need now you give me a chance to meet friends in the neighborhood i want an next community to like me and now i want half the globe to like me we're not just it's not just mowing the lawn because i decided to take up a hobby this is now my human yearning to be loved is now out of control and i'm making this little poor algorithm find me a zillion people who couldn't give a shit if I live or die. So th the thing is, we are emotionally idiots. And until we figure out what we really need and what's an addiction and all these questions that have to be asked, it'll run us pretty much. Because Yeah, us now. But, but I think, isn't that it? That, you know, we, we are human and we need to be connected and loved and belonged and, and all those things. Uh, and AI is not the answer to that question. The answer to that question is other humans. So if we can genuinely get more connections and more time for other humans, yes. 
No, but what bit, bit, what bit, but what bit, hold on a second. I think we, we keep saying we, right? Who, who's we here? And yeah, I think, yeah. I think something that, you know, I actually think about this a lot to do with um, thinking about aging research, but I think it could be thought about to do with um, AI. A lot of the work in terms of um, like anti-aging or transhumanism and so on and so forth is about extension of life. And it's going, we can get to 80 years old. So how do we get to further than that? And then you look at the, the average death rates in communities that are not wealthy white people and it's not 80 years old. So it's like, actually, why don't we try and get the people who are dying early at 50 years old to last to 80, right? So when we talk about we and what we want and what extra things are we not good at as humans, what extra things do we want? I think we also have to think about what is it that we, normally the people who are building these things, normally people who are talking about these things at conferences and so on and so forth, what do what do we have? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't think big, we shouldn't think, you know, uh, go and live on Mars and all these things, whatever. But I do think we have to have a bit of a reality check about what it is that's missing for humanity as a whole, as opposed to just us right here, right now. So I see Kate nodding. Yes, and seriously smiling. nodding. So go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I completely agree with Gemma. When we're talking about, well, we are talking about AI, we need to place ourselves in and, and say what our role is. And um, I said technocrats are running AI. We're, we're all part of that, you know, if we're involved in some way. I, try, I like to think that I'm not, because I'm sitting at the side in academia, sort of observing and saying critical things about it, but I'm still part of the influence. And, and we are, there's so many, <laughs> we, there are so many voices not being heard in AI, right? You know, where is the contribution from the global south, right? Who don't have, have the um, the money backing things, you know, the, the corporations that are all coming out of Silicon Valley. There are so many underrepresented groups. We're seeing that now. We're seeing the enhancement and the kind of embedded way that bias is propagating through systems um, because the systems are being designed with certain people in mind, usually white and male. So we need to we need to take responsibility um, and and spread that around. But it, interestingly, the, the the thing about you know we expand humans expand their time and expand the, what they want to do. I mean, we had that with the washing machine as well. You know, it was going to free up women and it was going to reduce labour. All we've done with that is wash our clothes more. You know, it, it has not freed up any more time really. That's uh, ridiculous, Kate. But but by 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 getting rid of domestication, it was so much more easier. For women to enter the labor force and to be exploited by the capitalist. Yes. Yeah, but then also, but then also to do all the chores still at home, as well as, as, well as be in the workforce. Fair enough. And, okay. And, and, fair enough. And isn't it interesting that it's immediately lockdown begins and twenty years of, of 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 equality of women's equality in the workplace gets erased within two weeks. So it's right. Absolutely incredible. So the asymmetry of power is a massive problem for AI. So all the big AIs are really being built by a small number of platform owners. And that is you know, capitalism just operating in its normal way. And if we have any vision of this sort of human centered AI that you know is actually supportive and helpful and whatever, um, you're really gonna have to think very, very hard about that problem. And we know it's a problem with disinformation and those platforms providing you know, all kinds of distorting factors so, and you can talk about regulation so the cows come home, but even the EU has not managed to regulate that stuff and AIs are going to make it worse. You know, the so, let, let's take a moment and, and actually think about this because I do want to shift away from humans as the loci of our consideration about the future. <clears throat> and I think it's because it's in our comfort zone because we don't really know what the future is going to look like into the technology that, that is going to be there in the future that the humans are going to have to interact with. So. Let me just sort of spin out a few small examples and then we'll sort of see where it goes and where we take it to John's point of, well, who is going to be building it, designing it, what sort of values will it have? So um, a, a couple in 2040 are going to rock up to a clinic and they're going to say, tell me about my baby. And they're going to find out about the intelligence and the hair color and the risks of certain diseases. And they're going to have a menu of what they can do. And they could say, well, actually, it's we can really make him uh, uh, really good at tennis, or we can really make him really good at snooker. Which would you prefer, right? Um, we can. Uh, we, he's. It turns out he's going to be a little bit violent, and that might be good. He'll be with his with oh, his, with his soaring testosterone and violence. He'll make the perfect Goldman Sachs banker, right? But what we could do is we could sort of neuter that down, and we'll turn him into a radiologist instead. Well, there's no radiologist, so. We'll change that, but you get the idea. We'll 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 we'll, we'll taper that down and, and have them sort of a, a graphic designer like Andy Warhol, right? Gender bending graphic designer. Um, we'll 
we will have that. And so that'll be one option. And then the next is they'll get into their self-driving car um, and they'll be transported somewhere else. Um, and they, and um, they will uh, go to a restaurant in which the maitre d' will be uh, a robot, a little drone flying robot. Um, in fact, little drone flying ro <clears throat> robots will be everywhere and they will be, they'll be your security guard and they'll be armed, right? And you know, it'll be based on facial recognition. So they'll see that in fact, you, that you've got good credit before you actually go into the restaurant because you don't pay with a phone anymore or anything. Like you just, just everything's, everything's done by facial recognition. And you know, woe to the person who you know, hasn't done X, who has a sort of a, a warrant for their arrest, et cetera. There's so no freedom. Um, cancel culture has come around so that there's even sort of a thought crime sort of element. We'll be able to read minds. I'm getting a little bit off the reservation, but you see where I'm going here. I wanted to pick a future through the looking glass that thinks about the world that we're going to inhibit, inhabit with the technologies that we have today that, are, we, that we can simply extrapolate on what it's going to look like tomorrow. What are we going to build? What do we need to do today to make sure we don't have the problems tomorrow? Because at the outset of the Industrial Revolution, if we knew what, was, what burning carbon would mean, we might have done something different. So what can we do now, seeing what, for example, facial, facial, facial recognition technology and, and the threats to privacy might mean, what can we do today to prevent bad things from happening? Well, I mean, we're already, we're already perfectly aware of the damage to the environment that's going on, and yet still cryptocurrencies are being mined every day. So I don't think we've learned that much, really. So <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, the facial recognition one's an interesting one. Um, is it going to come in by stealth? You know, is it going to be just bit by bit eroding away at our rights? And, the, and when I'm feeling particularly gloomy, I think, yeah, that's, that's the, the, we we'll have to come up with ways of sort of, sort of subverting it. Um, you know, maybe masks are the way, but you know, if we just wear masks forever, hey, maybe that helps. Yeah. I think it's about resistance, right? I mean, you said masks there. I mean, you, you've seen this in, for instance, Hong Kong with uh, the, the protesters doing all sorts of things to obscure being seen on CCTV, right? I mean, this and, you know, funnily you said inhibit instead yeah, of inhibit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, and, and I, I suppose what I was trying to what I'm thinking about is the more information that's out there and the more that these things are discussed, the more resistance we do start to see, right? Because we're outlining what's going wrong, what the problematic power structures there are and so on and so forth. Um, my worry is that, you know, <laughs> we might be losing our right to protest soon, right? So what, what does resistance look like if we are in a, a place where the, the, the politics of the day is um, <sighs> not necessarily so open to the idea of... Um, public opinion being um, yeah. showcased. And I think that that's really where, but where the power is, is in, is in education, is about talking about these things in, in a real way, not having tech and science as this thing that people think is too complicated that they shouldn't have an opinion on, um, and being able to make clear what all these issues are that, we, that have been brought up just in, I mean, just you talking there and putting that um, vision to life for us that work in this space, we, can, we were thinking of all the issues already, but not, not so when you're sort of used to seeing amazing, cool sci-fi and not really engaging in any other way, right? So the more that's put out there, the more we can enable uh, education, understanding, and hopefully then enable resistance. Can, it's just then what happens You can next prevent, you can present um, optimistic futures as well as dystopic ones. And so, for example, if you imagine you have um, no personally owned cars, then all the streets can become parks and people can walk around and not be obese and not die from pandemics so frequently. So there's a, there's a joined up piece of thinking, the kids, could 3D print things to go on the electric cars that drive themselves to deliver goods because they're not noisy. Drones will be way too noisy. It'll be huge noise pollution everywhere. And if they fall out of the sky, they'll hurt people. So clearly we have an alternative vision. You can build for any of these pieces, um, you know, that, that, that's perfectly good. Why do you have face recognition? Why does somebody need to use face recognition? There are perfectly good crypto protocols for establishing that you can pay for something without invading your privacy. Um, I, I can point you at half a dozen really nice designs for that, not Bitcoin based, by the way. And you know, so all these things that there are people working on positive minded alternatives that fit in a future vision, which you can roll out 
in, 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 a, in a direction where lots of people will support pieces of that. You know, there's a, where I live in Camden in North London, uh, there's a plan to put a whole park going up from the middle of Kentish town up to the heath, uh, just as a place you can walk up and down because the number of cars is falling really fast. In less than half the people around here have cars now because it's going to cost 12 quid a day to drive anywhere every day. You know, so these things are lined up thinking. Um, can I just say, you know, the way you were just um, describing that uh, that scenario is very much of my generation, you know, that greed, let's get it all, let's get the fast food out, let's have the, you know, the blonde area, you know, area child. But my, the next generation, I've noticed, because we piss them off so much by, as I said, turning the world into our garbage dump, um, there is already an attitude that we should have our ear to the ground. They're, you know, they're using tech to check out what businesses are screwing you. They're using it to now, you know, check uh, what we've done. And so there is something emerging that we're not discussing. That's a younger generation that's going to actually is the hope of the future. That they won't have the appetite that we do, you know. Oh, how much can you eat for $2.99? I grew up and I'm so ashamed. I grew up in the generation that was so, you know, uh, everything was possible. And we became, you know, the kind of um, lotus eater, eaters. So um, I think we should start making this, these pictures. Let's ask, especially my kids already say, it isn't all about money. It isn't all about feeding my face as fast as I can. You know, part of their problem is they have to stop us, you know, from um, before we devour the rest of the earth. That's where their attention should be, making those parts, you know. I think just to tie those to Ruby and John's point together as well, I mean, this idea of like alternative futures or other futures or whatnot, I think there seems to be this idea that we just have utopia or dystopia and we don't have kind of anything else um, in between. And you don't have to go far to look at completely different uh, visions of the future that have been around for a really long time, like read some Afrofuturism or indigenous futures or, or anything. It doesn't, you, you can even read just different futures by different white people, right? As opposed to the stuff that's always been uh, promoted mainly in, in the mainstream um, kind of publishing industry so I think that point around it's you know and resistance too is it can be a positive thing it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be this negative I mean one of the really interesting trends this year is there's been a sort of a few books that are being published at the moment around about Ludditism and sort of trying to bring that um, into fashion again right and it, instead of this word being you know having connotations of being you know someone who can't use tech who's an idiot when it comes to technology no the Luddites were actually very tech adept people they just didn't like crap tech being brought in and being used to kind of erase workers' rights. They actually really liked good tech that created good products, if you read the history of it. So I think that there's different ways of thinking about and reframing resistance and control and workers' rights and power that has means something different in 2021 than the sort of connotations of holding things back and being anti-progress um, and all that sort of thing. And, and really you get that from looking at all these different visions of the future that do already exist and are already out there. Well, I think if you, as another point, from a more practical measure, the, the dystopian future that you described requires an awful lot of joined up connectivity. And we don't have that. And I don't see us having that uh, for quite some time. For example, you know, we are the most surveyed country in terms of CCTV cameras in Europe, if not you know, beyond. Uh, and yet, if a crime happens and you say, oh, it was caught on CCTV, the police are like, well, we don't have that CCTV. That's not our CCTV. <laughs> You've got to go and talk to the people whose shop it is. And then you go to the people whose shop it is and they go, oh, no, we don't. We tipped over that last week. And, you know, we, we have we have all this data being collected, but it's not, thank God, it is not being aggregated fully yet. And that gives me hope because <laughs> I I'm a big believer in spreading out that data over different systems that will not hopefully maybe on on corporate grounds or on, you know, authoritative authoritary grounds will not um, share data and you know there are times when I want my data to be shared but there are many many times when I don't want my data to be pulled and shared and aggregated and I'm sort of hopeful that as we sort of tighten up on data um, that visions like this tracked future will not emerge and there are plenty of people doing wonderful work in that area and uh, yeah so <laughs> give them more money to fund them and get them to stick with that. But isn't it, I mean, we will always have the same demographics of, um, you know, the, the demonic coder or the one who believed they were, well, everybody, you know, Twitter, or whatever, they all thought it would benefit the good of mankind. And then, you know, show, get, show me the buck and we're sold on the river. I mean, that is human nature. Where's the point where you meant well? And then the other point where you said, screw it, I'm just going to grab as much as I, it's supermarket sweet for me. So, so I it, wonder what the role of institutions are 
uh, to shape our behaviors. I take the point that, that the human as a group, as a collective, um, moral man in moral society, as Reinhold Niebuhr put it, the great American theologian. Um, I take the point that, that, that humans as a collective make suboptimal decisions, as individuals we do as well. So of course, this isn't a new problem at the outset of the beginnings of stirrings of democracy, getting rid of the monarchy and the church. Um, it, it, there was, the problem was how do we actually bring together the collective so that you could actually constructively channel the public will? And the answer of course was Montesquieu and the separation of powers. There had to be an institutional innovation of checks and balances to actually take the human animal, the human corpus and channel their, uh, their ambitions and foibles in such a way that you could actually produce a, an optimal outcome from suboptimal parts. So if we're stuck in that same sort of challenge with artificial intelligence, we're building it because we're white guys and we don't think of other people. We're building it because we're following the venture capital money and it's short term and it's gonna be ad tech that we're doing this. Or we're just doing it because it's well-meaning like gene editing to get rid of Huntington's disease and it's gonna lead some ASP idiot to come up with a really bad idea that's gonna be heinous to human freedom and our values. So what sort of institutions do we need to think about today that feel right for the moment, for the 21st century, that will sort of channel our creativity productively? Oh man, anybody know that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what you said, what you said about institutional innovation is, is really interesting. I mean, without going, throwing the, the, the uh, monopoly board up and saying, let's just start again. I mean, of course, it's, it's not realistic, but at the same time, I think we need political innovations. I think we need innovations in terms of how we think about public property, the commons, like who owns things. For instance, I think if you could, if you could rethink intellectual property, for instance, um, I think that would do a lot of really interesting things to change incentive structures um, that happen even in the short term but I think there's a there's bigger I think there's bigger questions that kind of need to happen from a sort of um political and governance perspective and uh regulation of business um perspective uh, which so, so, is hard to answer your answer is sort of the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy answer so get rid of earth build a new world no, 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 no. okay we no, have, don't... We yeah. actually have examples of um uh, I'm, I'm work in decentralization and we have examples of re-decentralization for example a large number of people in um in catalonia in spain run a, a, a wholly people-owned network for, for literally a million people and there's no network provider it's providerless and they run services on it and they run um, uh, campaigns to collect money for children's playgrounds and all kinds of things on it it's called guifi which is just spanish for wi-fi um and you know when you look at the history of that area they were the syndicalist anarchists and syndicate scientists are not people who throw bombs, they're people that create new structures in society that work. Um, and this is a way to start thinking about using technology in, in purely publicly owned systems. So it's just you own your data, you own the computations over your data, and if somebody else wants to see it, they might give you something for it. That would be nice. So, um, you, you, know, you know what they used to Sandra. say in, in Barcelona, they, they said, well, when the anarchists ran the buses, at least they ran on time. Uh, because they, they were notoriously so efficient at running the bus service. I, I think this, this all comes back to that, that one question, which kind of came up implicitly in what you were saying, Kenneth, that what, you know, how do we get an optimal outcome? It's not, that's not the question. The question is, who decides what is the optimal outcome? Optimal for whom? And there isn't, there's no AI system that can do that. And this is, this is what I mean about, let's by all means, let the machines get on with the, the routine time consuming self, let them solve the problem of fusion so that you know, we can deal with climate change. But the, the, the messy business of working out what is optimal? What is the good life? Who's good life? Who gets to decide? Who gets to impose their idea of the good life on the other people for whom actually that doesn't look that good? Those are the questions and there, there is no easy answer to those and only humans can, can answer those questions. So yes, absolutely, we need institutional oversight and all those things as a practical measure. But really, un until we can have an argument about is privacy important? Why is privacy important? Privacy for me is important because it enables you to have public life and democracy as well as you know, a private life. But until we have those arguments and decide those things, 
then you know restaurants are going to use facial recognition to pay the bills because why wouldn't they okay this has been such a fascinating uh conversation and one that i didn't expect of course i thought by launching into pessimism and optimism as a way to sort of take the edge off a very hardcore geeky techie conference but then to go into the technology and of course anything but i tried to rein us back into technology and none of you guys <laughs> would go for it instead we've uh, thought very much about the human animal rather than the ai beast the good news is that uh i am an optimist and i think that ai is going to be having this transformative effect for the good in the future, but you've insisted upon me that I should temper my optimism with a, a degree of realism to recognize that that the human same human foibles that fail to address all of the, the challenges that we face today are we're still going to be dealing with in 10, 20, and 30 years. And we're not we're probably going to be failing to address the challenges of tomorrow as well. So the only thing that's left for me to say is to say thank you, to thank you for all the attendees who are have been a part of it, who I wish I could call on more. I want to thank the organizers, Michael and everyone at Oxford and UK AI, and most importantly, to thank the panel who has sort of shaped our views right now. That's Dr. Kate Devlin of King's College London, Tamandra Hark Harkness, John uh, Crawford of the Turing, Alan Turing Institute, Gemma Maline, the, the writer and researcher, and also Ruby Wax at the University of Southampton. Thank you very much. And this has been a fascinating conversation and I hope we can continue it in 10 and 20 years. Thank you. Ken. Thanks to you, Ken. Thank you.